Well, good morning and welcome along to our drive-in service from Molly Lane Free Presbyterian Church. I'm not sure whether we're mad or crazy today or maybe a little bit of fun, but I trust the Lord will bless us as we come about God's Word today. Let us begin with a word of prayer, please, and ask for the Lord's help even at this time. Eternal God and loving Heavenly Father, we do thank Thee and praise Thee for the opportunity to worship Thee, even in a fashion such as this. The Lord, we do pray that even now the God that doth control the wind and the waves, that our God will move and even still the storm, even as we gather about Thy Word today. O oh God, we pray, undertake for our need and help us to worship thee and glorify thee no matter the circumstances. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. I'm going to sing a familiar hymn to you, and it's a hymn that came to my mind this morning, considering the weather, considering the storm, and considering that wonderful day that is coming, when all will be perfect, and we will be with our Lord. Hymn number 612, There is a coming a day when no heartache shall come, no more clouds in the sky, no more tears to dim the eye. There is coming a day when no heartache shall come, no more clouds in the sky, Tears that in the eye, all is peace forevermore on that happy golden shore. What a day, glorious day that will be! What a day that will be when my Jesus I shall see and I look upon. The Lord is saved me by His grace When He takes me by the hand And leads me to the promised land What a day, glorious day that will be There'll be no sorrow there No more burdens to bear no more sickness, no pain, no more parting over there. And forever I will be with the one who died for me. What a day, glory, day that will be. What a day that will be when my Jesus I shall see, and I look upon his face, so what he saved me by his grace, when he takes me by the hand, and leads me through the promised land, what a day, glorious day, that will be. I wonder, Christian, are you looking forward to that day? What a day that will be. And there'll be no storms there. There'll be no wind or clouds or anything that will dim the eye. No, we will have perfect peace with our Lord and Savior forevermore. And I ask you today, will you meet me there? Will you meet me at the Golden Shore? Now, turning in the Word of God together, please, to Genesis chapter 47. Genesis chapter 47, please. Genesis chapter 47, we're going to read from the verse 13 through to the end of the verse 26. We're going to read this portion together, and then in a moment or two, we're going to focus upon the thoughts found in the verse 25. But Genesis chapter 47 and the verse 13, the Word of God states, 
and there was no bread in all the land, for the famine was very sore, so that the land of Egypt and all the land of Canaan fainted by reason of the famine. And Joseph gathered up all the money that was found in the land of Egypt and in the land of Canaan for the corn which they bought. And Joseph brought the money into Pharaoh's house. And when money failed in the land of Egypt and in the land of Canaan, all the Egyptians came unto Joseph and said, Give us bread, for why should we die in thy presence for the money faileth? And Joseph said, Give your cattle, and I will give you for your cattle if money fail. And, then, and they brought their cattle unto Joseph, and Joseph gave them bread in exchange for horses, and for the flocks, and for the cattle of the herd, and for the asses, and he fed them with bread for all their cattle for that year. When that year was ended, they came unto him the second year, and said unto him, We will not hide it from my Lord, how that our money is spent. My Lord also hath our herds of cattle. There is not all left in the sight of my Lord, but our bodies and our lands. Wherefore we shall die before thine eyes, both we and, both we and our land. Buy us and our land for bread, and we and our land will be servants unto Pharaoh, and give us seed that though we may live and not die, that the land be not desolate. And Joseph bought all the land of Egypt for Pharaoh, for the Egyptians sold every man his field, because the famine prevailed over them, so the land became Pharaoh's. And as for the people, he removed them to cities from one end of the borders of Egypt, even unto the other end thereof, only the land of the priests bought he not, for the priests had a portion assigned them of, of Pharaoh, and did eat their portion which Pharaoh gave them, wherefore they sold not their lands. Then Joseph said unto the people, Behold, we have bought you this day in your land for Pharaoh. Lo, here is seed for you, and ye shall sow the land, and it shall come to pass, in the increase that ye shall give the fifth part unto Pharaoh, and four parts shall be your own, for seed of the field, and for your food, and for them of your households, and your food for your little ones. And they said, Thou hast saved our lives. Let us find grace in the sight of my Lord, that we will be Pharaoh's servants. And Joseph made it a law over the land of Egypt unto this day that Pharaoh should have the fifth part, except the land of the priests only, which became not Pharaoh's. We trust the Lord will bless the public reading of his holy and precious word to each of our hearts. Could I especially welcome you here today on this very stormy and blusterous day. We do trust that in spite of the weather, that the Lord will speak unto you and that you'll be able to hear enough to have your soul blessed today. But please remember this afternoon in the will of the Lord, we will be holding our gospel service at 3.30, then on Wednesday at 8 p.m., the prayer meeting online, Friday at 8 p.m., the youth fellowship online, and then next Lord's Day we'll be at the drive-in again in God's will. 12 noon and 3.30 p.m. in the afternoon. Next Sunday will also be our Whitfield College Covenant offering. Now once again, could I say a special word of thanks to our brethren that have set up for the meeting today, especially to our brother Clifford Wilson. Last night he brought the trailer up again and he cleared the snow and then even this morning moved the trailer again because of the wind. We want to thank Roland and Clifford and our brother Eric for setting up everything on the platform as well. We do thank these men in the Savior's name. But last Friday evening, the Presbytery met, and in the will of the Lord, we hope to be opening our church building again for the prayer meeting on Wednesday the 3rd of March, 
and then Sunday the 7th of March. So the first meetings that would usually take place in March, God willing, if things don't change or if things get better, then we will be opening at the start of March. But turn with me again, please, to Genesis and the chapter 47. Genesis chapter 47, and I want to draw your attention to the verse 25, and I want you to note the subject, a people in subjection, a people in subjection. And they said, Thou hast saved our lives. Let us find grace in the sight of my Lord, and we will be Pharaoh's servants. Now with the word of God up before us, let's seek the Lord's face in a word of prayer together. Please, eternal God and loving Heavenly Father, we do pray that thy word may go forth with clarity. We pray that the weather may not be a distraction. We pray that Christ will be exalted, even in the difficult circumstances, that though we may rejoice in all of thy doings today. But give us help. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Now in the book of Genesis, we read a number of chapters concerning the life of Joseph. We read about Joseph and his 11 brothers. We read about how Joseph was the favorite of his father. We read of how his father made him a coat of many colors. We read of how his brothers in their jealousy threw him into a pit and sold him into slavery. We then read of how uh, Joseph is sold to Potiphar and how Potiphar's wife causes, uh, desires Joseph to try and sin. And when Joseph resisted the powers of evil, then he was put in prison under a false and pumped up charge. And we find in the present that Joseph answered and interpreted the dreams of both the butler and the baker. And we know that God had given Joseph a remarkable gift even in the interpretation of dreams. And Joseph was there for a time in the present largely forgotten about by his friend the butler. But then Pharaoh had a dream and Pharaoh needed to have his dream interpreted. And long story short, God used Joseph in a mighty way to not only interpret Pharaoh's dream, but also to save the people of Egypt and the people of Canaan. And Joseph was promoted to something like we would call the Prime Minister today. A man in charge of the affairs of the nation. A very important man in the land of Egypt and further afield. And we read of how Joseph stored up the food for the prosperous seven years. And then he was able to feed the land of Egypt and Canaan. For then the seven years of famine that prevailed after that. And we find here in Genesis chapter 47 that Joseph has been reunited with his brethren. Jacob has now been reunited with his son. The children of Israel are all going to be living in Goshen. And we find a further problem toward the back end of the seven years of famine. We find that the, uh, the people of Israel and the people of Canaan literally say, there is no money anymore. That we, we have nothing to give you, to, to buy the food from you now, Joseph. So an arrangement is made and initially Joseph takes their, their cattle and their livestock and then an arrangement is made as Joseph, on behalf of the nation, buys all of the land and allows the people to then farm on government land. And out of appreciation 
we read then the people's thanksgiving to Joseph in the verse 25. And all the people, the people of Israel, the people of Canaan, the people of the known world at that time said in the verse 25, Thou hast saved our lives. Let us find favor in the sight of my Lord, and we will be Pharaoh's servants. You know, my friends, Joseph is a wonderful picture and type of the Lord Jesus Christ. Joseph is one that ultimately went from a, a position of favor as a beloved son. He then went to a position of humiliation. He then went to a position highly exalted. And my friend, does that not tell you something of Christ? Christ going from the beloved Son of God in the home place of heaven's glory. And then he was humiliated. Then he came down to this earth and lived a life on our behalf and died an atoning death for us. And then because of Christ's faithfulness, he was exalted high above all. And he's seated at the right hand of the Father today. My friends, when we also go on to consider more about Joseph, we consider the fact that Joseph is one of the few characters in Scripture where no sin is attached to him. We read no sin in the life of Joseph. Now, of course, Joseph was just a man like you and I, and is a man of like passions as you and I. He was a man that no doubt did sin. But nonetheless, we find that the Scriptures make no mention of sin in the life of Joseph. And we find that Joseph is mentioned as a man that resisted sin when it came before him. And that is a wonderful picture of Christ. And I want to liken the verse 25, the people in subjection to Joseph, yes, to our subjection to Christ today. I want us to use these same words in thanking the Lord Jesus Christ for all that he has done in our hearts and in our lives and in everything that we do today. And I want you to say, Christian, with the people of Egypt, Thou hast saved our lives, referring to Christ, referring to the Lord Jesus. Thou hast saved our lives. Let us find grace in the sight of my Lord, and we will be God's servants. I want to liken this phrase to our lives today. And I want you to notice very quickly, and I'll not be long because I know there's many a distraction. I want you to know, number one, the need of the people. The need of the people. We've already touched on it a little, but we find in the verse 15 that there was an economic crash in the land of Egypt. There was no money. Therefore, there was going to be no food. Therefore, they were going to die. And their families were going to die. And this was a great need. Ultimately, because of the situation, they were going to die. Well, my friend, let me tell you this. Because of the situation of our sin, because of the situation of our hearts, because of the situation of our lawlessness and defiance against God, you and I have a great need. And you and I, if we do not have our sins addressed, are most certainly going to die. What solemn things these are. And as Joseph was the only hope for the people of Israel, so the Lord Jesus Christ is the only hope for sinful men this Sabbath day. And as the people of Egypt could say of Joseph, Thou hast saved our lives, so we can say of Jesus Christ today, Thou hast saved our lives. Turn with me please to John chapter
chapter 6. John chapter 6 and the verse 35. In regard to this parallel of famine in the land, well, the Word of God reminds us that our sin is likened unto a famine within our own souls. And we find that Christ is the bread. Christ is the Savior. Christ is the provider. Christ is the one we need. John 6, verse 35 states, And Jesus said unto them, I am the bread of life. He that cometh to me shall never hunger, and he that believeth on me shall never thirst. You see, my friend, as Joseph was the provider of bread for the physical needs of Egypt, so Christ is the provider of spiritual bread for our souls today. We can be saved, we can be nourished, we can be replenished, and we can have heaven as hope because of Jesus Christ. And we find there the need of the people. But secondly, I want you to know the saving of the people. The saving of the people. Look what it says in the verse 25. We read it now in the past tense. And we read in verse 25, Thou hast saved our hearts. We were in need, but the work has now been done. We were starving to death, but now we have bread. We were dying without water, but now we have the water that Joseph has provided. Yes, we were dying, but now we have been saved. And my friends, we see how Joseph saved the people. Look at the verse 20. The verse 20 says, And Joseph bought all the land of Egypt for Pharaoh and the Egyptians, because the famine prevailed over them, so the land became Pharaoh's. Then we find in the verses 23 and 24, Then Joseph said unto the people, Behold, I have bought you this day and your land for Pharaoh. Go, there is seed for you, and ye shall sow the land, and it shall come to pass in the increase. And it shall come to pass in the increase that ye shall give. The four parts shall be your own, and the seed of the field and your food, and for them your household, and the food for your little ones. And there we find that ultimately the salvation came by Joseph by God. He paid a price in order to see these people saved. And does that not remind us of the Lord Jesus Christ? Christ didn't have any obligation upon him. He didn't have to pay a price. He didn't have to save us. He didn't have to do anything for us. But the Word of God tells us that our souls are bought not with silver and gold, not with pearls, not with diamonds, not with jewels, but we are bought with a precious price. Look what it says in 1 Peter chapter 1 and the verses 18 and 19. Oh, beloved, here we find the far greater one than Joseph, that we find that he also paid a price upon Calvary's hill, and the price was his own precious, efficacious blood. The Word of God says in 1 Peter 1 verse 18, For as much as ye know that ye were not redeemed with corruptible things as silver and gold, from your vain conversation received by tradition from your fathers, but with the precious blood of Christ, as of a lamb without blemish and without spot. Oh, my friend, do you know what else thrills my soul about this salvation? We read that when Joseph bought up the lamb, we also read in the Word of God that Joseph then essentially gave them back the lamb. They were still allowed to live on the lamb, they're still allowed to farm on the land. And we find that 
out of 100% of the crops that were brought in, Pharaoh only took 20% and they and their families kept 80% of the produce. Now does that not remind us of Christ? That Christ has bought us with a price? That Christ has redeemed us with His precious blood? Christ has made us new creatures in Christ and then even in spite of our not deserving it, He then rewards us on top of His salvation. Oh my friends, here we find some wonderful, wonderful pictures of the Lord Jesus Christ. But then I want you to know with me thirdly, number three, the thanksgiving of the people. The thanksgiving of the people. Look at the verse 25 again. The very fact that they're speaking, the very fact that they're talking, the very fact that they are making this declaration in the verse 25, it says, and they said, so they've got something on their hearts. And here we find the thanksgiving of the people of Israel. And they declare it from the rooftops. And they say, Thou hast saved our lives. I ask you, my friend, after Christ has saved you in your time of need, after Christ has purchased you with His own blood at the cross of Calvary, after Christ has then rewarded you I ask you, is your tongue and your heart and your soul full of thanksgiving to the triune God? Are you praising Him today? Are you thanking Him today? Is your heart full of joy and happiness today? Because the people of Israel were, or Egypt were a happy people at this time and they thanked Joseph for his mercy and I ask you, my friend, are we today as God's people a happy, rejoicing people, knowing that we deserve to die in our sin, knowing that we were helpless in our sin, but Jesus Christ has saved us and purchased us with His own blood. Turn with me please to 1 Chronicles chapter 16 and the verse 34. And here we find the attitude of the believer. Here we find the attitude that should prevail within our souls every single day. Here we find the attitude of how we ought to be every morning when our feet touch the ground and we open our eyes. It says in 1 Chronicles 16 verse 34, Oh, give thanks unto the Lord, for He is good. For his mercy endureth forever. Oh, my friend, I ask you, maybe this is an encouragement to you. Keep rejoicing, but maybe, just maybe, it's a rebuke to your heart. Did you thank the Lord today? Did you thank the Lord for his mercy? Did you thank the Lord for his kindness? Did you thank the Lord for his salvation? Did you thank the Lord for his salvation. Oh my friend, are we a thankful people? But then, last of all, I want you to know not only the need of the people and the saving of the people and the thanksgiving of the people. I want you to know fourthly, please, the acknowledgement from the people. The acknowledgement from the people. Now look what it says in the latter part of the verse 25 with me please. It says, Thou hast saved our lives, let us find grace in the sight of my Lord, and we will be Pharaoh's servants. Now here we find an acknowledgement. Why did Joseph see them in mercy in their time of need. Why did Joseph buy up their lands and their livestock? Why did Joseph save them? My friend, it was all out of grace. 
Joseph did not have to do that. Joseph didn't have to save them. Joseph didn't have to do anything for them. In fact, when you see how Joseph was treated, how he was lied about, how he was put in an Egyptian prison, how even his friends, the baker and the butler, or oh, the butler especially, turned his back on him when he was prospering. My friend, Joseph had no reason whatsoever to help the people of Israel. But out of mercy and out of grace, that's exactly what he did. And my friend, listen to me as I say this, Jesus Christ, when He saw us in our need, and when He saw us in our sin, and when He saw us in our peril, He didn't have to save us. But Jesus Christ came down to this earth, and He died, and He shed His blood, and He bought us with a price. Why? Out of grace, 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 marvelous grace. What does grace mean? simply means unmerited favor. In other words, we did nothing to deserve it. We did nothing to merit it. We did nothing to deserve it. But my friend, God has lavished upon us His remarkable grace, just like Joseph showed grace to the people of Israel. And here we find an acknowledgement from the people of Israel saying, I don't deserve this. I don't deserve to live. I don't deserve food on the table. I don't deserve such a king as Joseph. But I know it's come about by grace. And we can say the same of Jesus Christ. The Word of God says in Ephesians 2, verses 8 and 9, For by grace are ye saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. And my friend, if you're not saved today, then I encourage you, come to Christ while there's time. If you're not saved today, then I encourage you, trust Him right now. If you're not saved today, then I say to you, my friend, Stop relying on good words. Stop relying on yourself. Stop relying upon church attendance and throw yourself completely upon the mercy of Almighty God. And He will save out of grace. What an acknowledgement this is. A Christian, I ask you, are you acknowledging where your salvation has come from today. And if not, I plead with you, do not mock God, for God is not mocked. But thank Him today, acknowledge Him today, remember Him today, and say with the people of Israel, Thou hast saved our lives, let us find grace in the sight of my Lord. Let's bow in a word of prayer together, please, as we draw to a close. Heavenly Father, Thou knowest the distractions today, Thou knowest the hindrances, but, O oh God, we pray that Thou would have a word for our hearts, and we pray that Thou bless Thy people and encourage Thy people, and we pray that Thou would say to the animals, we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you and thank you for coming. Same journey home.